Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids Encounter stories. First story, Georgia Wendigo Encounter. Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, camping and hiking were things me and my brother did so often it was second nature. So anytime Ryan and I had a break from school we would head straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail in the Cahuta Wilderness, and it's a trail we knew fairly well as we had used to a few times before to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trailhead around lunchtime, parked the car, got our gear out, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as moved along and asked them how the trail looked and the answer was always the same, wet? Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17-mile-plus journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall settling in it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, Ryan and I have this rule. We don't camp near people if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods never to be seen again. So we always camped a pretty decent ways off of the trail and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. Roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we would be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend and ventured about half a mile off the trail into a clearing and set up. We built a teepee fire lay for that night and pitched our tents on either side. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around some of many swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around 5 o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set the cold rushed in, we added more wood to the fire, sat close and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior, and he was a sophomore, but growing up we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, had the same hobbies, etc. Around nine, we were settled comfortably around the fire. I had just texted our mom to let her know we were safe and getting ready for bed and I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and having the same awkward conversations we had each year with family we only saw on holidays when things started to get strange. We were no stranger to sounds in the woods and these woods were full of animals from deer to black bears, and even the random wild boar. If you were in the woods enough you learned to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing I can only chalk up to is odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs you hear a tighter group of steps, but what we were hearing sound very distinct to what a human sounds like when walking slowly or trying to move without making much sound. I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and shone it in the direction we felt the sounds were coming from, but that is what was so weird. Whenever we would fix our lights on a spot, we thought the sound were coming from the location of the sound would suddenly change. It was as if there were multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first I thought it was the wind and I remember thinking maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around and what we are hearing is nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing that. I didn't answer and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes. Over and over again, Ryan kept asking if I heard that and I put my finger to my lips trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight. My fist clenched. 
knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever, but thinking it through was maybe five minutes when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey! Quiet. The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a, what the hell, look and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? I was done. I stood up shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud. Inhumanly loud, I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now this is the part one will never forget. The part one never liked to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with a dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag I had a 6 inch fixed blade that I always carried and thought I would feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand more than just my flashlight. Yes I want to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes toward the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me, and for maybe two seconds I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I heard it but never saw. I don't think I have ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about what I saw. Maybe 10 minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view, asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement and then heard my scream and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy but it didn't seem to work point one of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we called the police and roughly 30 minutes later a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried explaining everything to him but he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail and will probably never go back. Second story, hunted by a Wendigo. I've posted this in the Wendigo community I'm in, but I also wanted to share this here to see if anyone else has any intel that can help me since the other community seems to be pretty quiet. I realize how unbelievable this story might be, but I assure you it's entirely true. I've had countless experiences with the supernatural since I was four, I'm 33 now, but this is one of the most terrifying ones I've had. I've looked at some of the stories in this community to see if there's anything I haven't discovered yet. I thought that if I shared my encounter here, there might be someone who has some information that could help. Please don't comment if you don't believe in the supernatural. I've seen skeptics plastering their two cents on some posts. I'm looking for legitimate information. My questions are at the end of this. Thanks in advance. I had an experience with a Wendigo this fall in early October in northern Minnesota in a state forest, very close to, if not on, a reservation. I've always heard that speaking of them can draw them to you. But I hadn't thought of, 
or listen to any Wendigo stories any time close to my encounter. I was staying with some very dear friends. I'll call them M and C, and they have a camper in their yard by the lake for guests to sleep in. I had walked down to the camper from the house with my miniature dachshund, Ebony, around midnight and found that I needed to set some things up, primarily the heater. By the time I was done getting everything in order, it was approximately 1.30. I never thought to lock the door because, really, I figured it's in the middle of the woods so there was nothing to worry about. I was wrong. I had closed the curtains, thank God. And I was having trouble falling asleep because my anxiety was going mad. M and C's dogs were barking outside, and their geese wouldn't stop honking. Ebony, who usually sleeps under the covers, was sitting on my hip while I laid on my side, and I could feel her turning her head back and forth, like she was trying to track something outside. I tried tucking her under the blankets to calm her down, but she kept returning to her perch on my hip. I have no idea how long I laid there. I would say at least 40 minutes, when all of a sudden I heard M's voice outside the camper. Anybody in there? Hmm. And what sounded like claws dragged down the side of the camper. I almost called back to her when I realized number one. She and C were both fast asleep by now and number two. M knew I was in there. She wouldn't ask if anybody was. Suddenly, I noticed everything had gone absolutely silent outside. The dogs and the birds had stopped carrying on. The gusts of wind had even stopped. It was the kind of silence you hear about in horror stories. How the woods go mute when something evil is in the area. Then another thought hit me. Ebony would be losing her sage asterisk T and barking at the door if that had been anything human. She was frozen on my hip, dead quiet, shaking. I didn't dare to move but I was really starting to have to pee, and I remembered that I hadn't locked the door. I have no idea how long I laid there debating whether I should get up and use the bathroom and lock the door, but it felt like an eternity. In reality, I guessed it was maybe 10 to 15 minutes. I thought it may have been a skinwalker at first, but remembered they don't mimic the voices of your loved ones to lure you into the woods. Vindigogdu I knew these creatures, demons, whatever they are, can lure humans out of their abodes if they make eye contact with you. And everything in me was screaming to make sure I didn't look outside. I made doubly sure I didn't look through any cracks in the curtains as I walked softly to the front of the camper and very slowly turned the lock, praying and holding my breath. I made sure to keep my eyes away from the windows as I crawled back in bed, and pulled Ebony close and she finally stayed under the blankets. I snuck a peek at my phone for the time before I laid down, figuring it had to be close to 3 a.m., the witching hour. It was about 2.30. As soon as I laid down, the wind kicked back up in M and C's basset hounds erupted into howls as they came running down to the camper and a little ways into the trees, and the geese started their noise again. I heard the Bassets come back to the camper, barking a few more times before they laid down outside the door to protect me. I didn't get out of bed again that night. I told M and C what had happened the next morning. I think I was hoping M would say she had come down to check on me and Ebony, but she confirmed what I already knew. They had gone to bed as soon as I had left the house. I said a prayer over their house, the camper, and all of us the following night, and had an uneventful night, thank God. I also spoke with another guy who's familiar with the supernatural to see if he knew any more about Wendigo Ack. I'm not sure how accurate the information he gave me was, or if it's reliable at all, but when I asked him why Ebony hadn't made a peep, I had assumed it was because she was absolutely petrified, he said a Wendigo can control animals to keep them from alerting their owners about its presence. He also told me one. They can't enter houses that aren't made of wood directly from the forest they're hunting in, tents and campers included because they consist of man-made materials too. A lock is useless. 
They can unlock and open a door so they can try to lure you outside in three. They typically stay in the woods, but they will come into a smaller town and never into a city. I had never heard of any of what he told me before, so again, I can't speak for accuracy, but I also haven't researched the claims either. He also advised me never to go outside to pee at night if I ever go camping and to bring a bucket or something to use, and to make sure that I always close tent flaps and curtains before falling asleep. He said if the flaps are open so you can see outside, the Wendigo can make eye contact with you and draw you out. After leaving M and C's to go to my father's house for a few days, I had the distinct feeling of being watched when I took Ebony outside after dark. My father lives three hours away from M and C, but his house is in the country. I told myself it was only the fear from the experience and what I know about the Wendigo triggering an overactive imagination. I never heard anything, and I watched Ebony's behavior very closely and she didn't act like she had in the camper. I'm moving back to that area from Canada, and this experience has been weighing heavily on my mind. I've been trying to find any information about warding them off, or if they have a home hunting range like cougars do, or if they move on from a region. My prayers did work the second night, so I figure I can pray over the property. I also have holy water that I can use, since the Wendigo is an evil spirit that possesses people or physically manifests. Frustratingly, a majority of what comes up in searches is utter garbage like Wikipedia. Does anyone know if a Wendigo stays in one area? Are my concerns about it coming back when I get moved into my cabin warranted? Or am I worrying excessively? Do you have any tips for warding them off? Thanks again for any information you can offer. Third story. There is something in Forest Glen National Park. When I was in my teens, my friend Robert and I would often visit Forest Glen National Park. It's a national forest preserve that's located just about 15 miles from my hometown. It offers camping, fishing, and most importantly for our purposes back then, many winding trails to hike on. Robert and I didn't have a whole lot to do back in the day. So Forest Glen is where we would go to spend a lot of our time. Both of us enjoyed the outdoors and we would go hiking on one of the many trails nearly every day. Sometimes we'd do two or three depending on our mood. It wasn't long, of course, before we knew them all by heart and we both had our favorites. That didn't matter though. We would still go on any of them on any given day. Eventually, though, time went on and Robert and I grew up. Robert and I are still good friends, but we hadn't been out to Forest Glen in a long time. It was recently that I had been reminiscing about those old trails though, and I decided that I wanted to go back out there and visit some of my favorite spots. So two weeks ago I called Robert, and asked if he wanted to go back out there with me that weekend and to my surprise, he was overjoyed at my proposal. He said he'd been thinking about going out there himself but just hadn't gotten around to it. So it was decided. On Saturday morning, we would head out to Forest Glen and meet up at one of Robert's favorite trails. I made it out to that trail at Forest Glen about 10 after 6 in the morning. When I drove out to the reserve, I parked my car in the spot closest to the trail, but I didn't see Robert's car. There's more than one entrance into the park, so I thought that Robert hadn't arrived yet or he was parked at one of the spots that was near one of the other entrances. I thought I might call him, but when I looked at my phone I saw that I only had one bar, and figured that it wouldn't go through. I should have known the reception would be bad out there. Stashing the phone in the glove box, I got out and made my way to the trail. I started to do some stretches in front of the trail entrance, while I waited for Robert to arrive. After waiting for what felt like about 10 minutes, I began to wonder if Robert was going to show up late. When we made the plans to show up at the trail, we agreed on 6.30 a.m. I thought about jogging back to my car to grab my phone and call him after all, but I decided to instead venture into the trail a little ways and then return after a moment to see if he had shown up. I started my walk at a brisk pace into the opening of the trail. 
The clear patch of the trail's entrance quickly gave way to a narrow cleared path, surrounded on both sides by a thick growth of brush and tall trees. The trail seemed a bit more overgrown than I remembered, but I suppose that was a good thing. It meant that the preserve was thriving. I did notice, however, that it was rather quiet out there on the trail. That isn't to say I there was no sound at all. I could hear the occasional caw of a bird and the rustling of leaves, but the sound seemed somehow muted. It was as if the entire woods had its volume button turned way down low. About three minutes into my stroll, I stopped just before a small stream that cut through the trail. I looked to the other side of the stream where the trail's path resumed. The path stretched out a few hundred feet beyond the stream and looked like it forked off in two different directions as far as I could tell. This is when I decided to turn back and wait for Robert at the entrance. I never knew this trail like Robert used to, and for the life of me I couldn't remember how far it went. Before I turned to leave I knelt down to tie my sneaker. When I finished, I stood up and had to stifle a scream. Robert was standing right in front of me, grinning like an idiot, and when he saw the look on my face he howled with laughter. My face went hot and I gritted my teeth. What the hell, man? I yelled, you nearly gave me a freaking heart attack. Robert had to stifle his laughter to be able to reply. Sorry, bud. I couldn't help myself. I was up farther on the trail when I decided to turn back and wait for you. When I saw you kneeling here, I just couldn't resist. I couldn't help but smile after that, and I could feel the red-hot feeling in my face start to drain away. It's okay, but you did scare the living hell out of me. I didn't even hear you. Robert said nothing. He only smiled a wide, toothy grin. I gestured down toward the part of the trail Robert came from. I was wondering if you had gotten here yet. You can lead. I assume you know the way? Robert nodded in reply, then jerked his head back to where the fork in the trail was before he turned around and bounded over the stream that divided the trail. When his feet hit the other side of the small bank, he just kept on running. Hey, wait up. I called after him. He acted as if he didn't hear me, and carried on deeper into the wood. I really wasn't prepared to jog yet. I wanted to walk a little more first and stretch out my legs. However, it seemed I didn't have a choice, and I bounded after Robert, hopping over the stream and pushing myself to catch up with him. Robert was jogging at an even pace, but not a quick one, and soon I was just behind him. Can you wait just a second? I asked. Why, what are you afraid of? He asked, turning to me with a wide toothy grin that seemed to have not left his face. That question caught me off guard. What did he mean by that? Nothing. Just need to stretch a little more before I pull something is all. Robert didn't stop or slow down. He just kept on smiling as he turned his head back around to face forward. You'll be fine. There's a nice place to rest just after the fork in the trail. We kept on jogging until we hit the fork, and I followed just behind Robert every step of the way as we veered off onto the right path. Shortly after the fork, the trees of the forest grew denser and numerous, their leaves blotting out light from the sky above. Even the path itself started to become more overgrown, as weeds and brush seemed to reach out toward the center of the path attempting to catch what sunlight they could. Where before it seemed that the sounds of the forest were on low volume, here they seemed to be on mute as not even a buzzing of an insect could be heard. Though I could attribute the muted sounds of the forest to not being able to hear them over my heavy breath and stomping feet, the dense growth could not be ignored. This trail doesn't seem very well maintained. Are you sure you know where you're going? I asked Robert, still keeping close pace behind him, though my right leg was starting to burn. Robert didn't answer, but ignored me instead without slowing down. I stopped and knelt down to rub my leg. I looked up to see Robert stop and turn around to walk back to where I was kneeling. Sorry man, I told you though I needed to stretch more. 
I think I already hurt myself. Robert just smiled as he leaned on a tree next to me. Sorry, man. I thought you'd be able to make it. We're not far from a really cool spot. I just got excited to be out here with you again. At Robert's words, I couldn't help but laugh and return a beaming grin back to him. I had no idea he missed being out here so much. On top of that, it had been a couple weeks since we had done anything together. So maybe Robert also just missed hanging out. I couldn't blame him. I did too. But growing up gets in the way. Don't sweat it, man. I said, I really miss this too. What's the really cool spot you wanted to show me? Robert's grin seemed to somehow get even bigger. Okay. Do you remember that wooden bridge we found one of the last times we were out here? It has that really deep stream running under it. The memory came back to me in a rush. It was vague. But I did remember finding a bridge the last time we came out here. I had completely forgotten which trail we found it on though. I remember the water under that bridge was so clear you could easily see the fish swimming about within it. It's on this path? I asked excitedly. It sure is, and I can't wait to take you there. I've been down there already. It is absolutely beautiful. Robert said. I stood up quickly and brushed some dirt off my knee. Well, let's go. I exclaimed, walking forward on the trail. Okay, but we can walk. I don't want you to hurt yourself. Robert said. I was going to tell him I would be fine if we jogged again, but I thought better of it. Though the excitement that came with the prospect of seeing that bridge again abetted some of the pain in my sore leg, it was still there. So we walked on, talking about the memories of being out here on the trails as we walked side by side. Robert was recounting things I hardly remembered. He said he remembered a time when I scrapped up my knees really bad after a nasty fall on one of the trails, but I didn't remember that. For the most part, though I could recall every memory Robert had, and I realized how much time we really had spent out there. We spent nearly all our time out here as teenagers, staying in shape to try to impress the girls in school. We had been walking for nearly five minutes, when Robert said, Hey, do you remember when you fell down that slope and hit the bottom? I thought you died. Robert belted out a loud booming laugh. I stopped walking, because something about what he said didn't make sense. I remembered falling down that slope like it was yesterday. It was terrifying. Robert, you fell down that slope too, remember? Robert, who hadn't stopped walking until then, froze just ahead of me. He turned slowly, to me, and slapped a hand to his forehead. Oh duh, yeah, well I didn't fall as hard as you. Robert laughed again, dropping his head and gesturing back down the trail. Come on, we're almost there. I began to breath heavily, and I took a step back. Something was wrong, I didn't know what it was, but I had to get out of those woods and away from Robert. I had to get away because a memory had finally resurfaced to the shore of my recollection. A memory of me falling and scraping my knees. Robert's grin for the first time since he snuck up on me, faded from his face. What's wrong, bud? He asked, a little shaky. I need to go back. I said, a little shaky myself. Robert took a step toward me, and a look of concern spread on his face. Come on, man. We're so close. Why do you want to leave? He pleaded. Because you were homesick the day I scraped my knees. Robert's eyes widened in realization as I turned tail and began sprinting in the other direction as fast as my legs would carry me. Green leaves and brown bark flashed by in my peripheral vision as a blur. The sound of wind swished around in my ear lobes as I ran. I couldn't hear footsteps behind me, and I was thankful for that. My right leg throbbed and begged for me to stop, but I wouldn't. Fear is one hell of a motivator, and it pushed me past the fork in the path and over the small stream that divided the trail. I never looked back to see if Robert, or whatever wore Robert's skin, was following me, not even once. I kept my eyes on the path in front of me, 
and focused on not tripping over anything the whole way back out of the trail. I didn't stop running till I got into my car. Once inside I grabbed the keys that I'd left sitting in the passenger seat and quickly turned them in the ignition. I paid no attention to the speed limit as I raced all the way home. Once at my house, I grabbed my phone out of the glove box and ran into the house, latched the deadbolt behind me. I turned my phone off when I stored it in my car at the preserve, so once I got inside I turned it on and sat on my couch while I waited for it to boot up. My plan was to call Robert immediately, but when the display on the screen flicked on I saw, I had a text message from Robert. I opened it, but I was shaking so bad from the adrenaline it was a little hard to read. Hey man, so it looks like we can't go out of Forest Glen. I was talking to my neighbor this morning, and he said they closed it down at least four hikers have been found dead by drowning out there. I hope this gets to you before you leave, maybe we can just catch a movie or something. When I read the last word of the text message, there was a loud knock at my door. I jumped and stood from my spot on the couch. The knock came again, even louder, and I crept over to the door as quietly as I could look through the peephole. It was Robert. Robert stood on my front stoop with a wide toothy grin. I saw him raise up his hand to knock once more, and as the sound thundered from the wood of the door I backed away. On my phone, I searched my contacts for Robert's name and dialed. After two rings, Robert picked up. Hey man, what's up? Robert asked. Robert, where are you right now? I asked. Well, I'm at the store right now, do you want? His voice cut out as I hung up and immediately began dialing the police. I explained to the dispatcher that there was an intruder trying to break into my house and I did not feel safe. The woman on the other end told me to remain calm and she would be sending help to my address. When I hung up with 911, I went to the door once again to look through the peephole. The Robert imposter was gone. When the police arrived, I just told them someone tried to break into my house and I came home to find them messing around with my door before they ran off. I didn't know what else to say. They said they would file a report and send a squad car by every couple of hours that day to make sure everything was fine. That was two weeks ago. Ever since that day, late at night, that thing comes back and knocks on my door. In a warped mockery of Robert's voice, it calls to me. Let me in, it wails. Let me in. I am just so lonely. Come be with me. The first time, I obviously called the police in the time after that. The third time, they stopped coming. That creature is always gone when they get here, but he always comes back. He's back tonight, and I can hear him as I sit on my couch with a bottle of brandy and a tight grip on the large butcher knife I own. Oh please, let me in. It pleads in a gargled wail that sounds nothing like Robert anymore. I need more friends. I don't know what the hell is in Forest Glen National Park, but it followed me home. Fourth story. The time I saw a Wendigo. First things first. This happened to me when I was around 10. I've lived in Idaho all my life and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother, and I would always hike up whatever trails we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River, the river there never freezes over, and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel board through the mountain at one part of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when the eye heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-thirds of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end we entered through. The screech wasn't like anything I've heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights. I even think I've heard Bigfoot calls a few times, but never the metallic, grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, whatever the sound was it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it, 
and my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made the noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. Whether it was the thing that screeched at us or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing through the darkness outside the trailer. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was, but he refused each time, telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day, and my life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but chalked what happened up as a harmless event that I must have been exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here I would mess around with my cousins, our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide-and-seek, a game called Ghosts in the Graveyard, and other games like that. On one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide-and-seek game. Because I was one of the younger cousin, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally, all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the nearby trees, or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit, we would always whistle as a hint at our locations. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree, known as the underwear tree. You can guess why. So I began trekking up toward the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on wearily, and convinced myself that I would be fine. I hated walking in the night alone, but figured whoever I find would walk me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong, because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out, I found you Scott. I thought the whistle was my older cousin's. Come back down with me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call, you almost had me, so I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features, as soon as I saw the creature I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp I saw a few people, my cousins, at the bottom of the mountain waiting for me. I was crying and shaking and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night, and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games after that happened, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. I used to be really religious and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that, but those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago the game, Until Dawn, became really popular and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in game, I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figure someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge and resorted to cannibalism, but that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screech from time to time. It never occurred to me until watching until dawn that they might be from the same thing. And it scares the hell out of me every time. I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. 
Fifth story, the howls of a blind Wendigo. Imagery for the story, truck driver with a mid-sized company. My assigned truck being a long-nosed Peterbilt with one of those driver-controlled searchlights mounted just above the mirror. I've been driving for five years, have gone 650,000 miles, and somehow managed not to lose my mind in the process. Come one autumn day about a year back and I was given the delivery that would bring me an experience I hadn't thought would exist except in my worst nightmares. I had received a message on my truck's computer to make a multi-stop run from Indianapolis to Duluth, then from Duluth to a town called Ely. The run to Duluth had been no problem with a two-day trip. The run from Duluth to Ely seemed a bit trickier. What with the quickest, legal, run being Minnesota Route 1 from Minnesota 61. It was that certain kind of night where everything was shrouded in darkness. The moon was covered by the clouds and a winter storm was on the horizon, making the air even colder than it already was. I figured that I deserved a nice warm cup of coffee after this drive was over. The drive along 61 was uneventful with only a couple of cars and semi-tractors on the road this late into the night. The radio was calling for a light forecast of hazy rain with a relatively thick fog until that afternoon. All the more reason to get this run finished, I supposed. Sometime along Route 1, my trailer began shaking violently with my truck having difficulty in pulling it. Pulling along a flat line of grass, I noticed one of my tires on my trailer had ruptured. Annoyed with losing time. I pulled into a small grove and parked along a worn dirt path facing the highway. To rear of my tractor was a thick bundle of northern forest that likely hadn't seen human tracks in decades. A quiet wind washed over me as I relayed a breakdown message to my company, receiving another that a tow wouldn't be out until the morning, no problem. I've got a fridge full of food and a satellite for TV. Several hours passed as I laid in my bed. A wind storm woke me up as I tossed and turned to gain my bearings. That wasn't wind I was hearing. The best I can describe it is the sound of metal sliding against metal. Like the brakes of a locomotive. The noise was some distance away, roughly a quarter mile to the rear if I had to guess. The noise was getting closer more to the left of my truck, somewhat about the front of the trailer. I could hear what sounded like tapping fingers or claws against my trailer. The sound of hoofsteps marching through the thick grass alerted me to the fact that this may be just a harmless animal, wishing to take a look and ease my nerves. I slid the curtains open and came face to back with the stuff of nightmares. The antlers reached to the top of my truck's windows. The creature brandishing them was a haunched over, bipedal mass of skin and bones with the skull of some deer or elk. Fearfully, I turned the searchlights on to get a better look at the thing in question and to hopefully frighten it off. I wish I hadn't. The light itself hadn't alerted the creature, but me moving myself in the truck had set it into a hunched-over stance. Keeping an ear open for some form of prey I presumed. I noticed empty eye sockets that seemed to go on forever that slotted into the ancient skull of some sort of deer or elk. I was afraid of turning the key in fear of rousing this monster's predatory hunger. It looked near starvation, as though it had been years since it last ate. I sat and waited. It was near five o'clock. The tow wouldn't come to work until around seven. A buck, roughly a ten-pointer, meandered into the field before spotting the creature in question. This thing has to have some great hearing since it didn't see the deer wander across its sight lines. It was blind, had to have been. Moments passed before the buck began chomping on berries from a nearby bush. The blind monster heard the sounds and pounced. From 15 feet, it took all but 5 seconds for the buck to have been gutted and torn apart. The creature didn't seem to want the buck for food more or less rather for twisted enjoyment. I had seen enough. Turning the engine over, the monster looked in my general direction and roared threateningly as it rushed to make contact with my truck. 
I managed to pull forward just enough that it made contact with the trailer instead. The trailer lifted up a few inches as the sound of bending metal embedded itself into my ears. Shifting from third to fifth and continuing to ten, the creature was still in chase until I crossed over a hill. Looking back through my mirrors, the monster was gone. I pulled off and got out. The sounds of scraping metal were far and away, replaced by the quiet rustling of trees. I continued driving again until I came upon an area that trucks could park in, well lit and asphalt. Much better and safer than the grove from earlier. Afternoon came and I went to inspect the damage from last night's incident done to my trailer. Claw marks etched into the driver's side of the trailer went on for the whole length of 53 feet. A massive dent roughly two feet from the truck itself reminded me that I wasn't just fortunate to be alive. I was damn lucky. The delivery went off without complication since the tow only had to change a tire, and I went home several days later, the creature still on my mind. I went online to figure out, bluntly, whatever the hell it was. The skull of a deer and possible bloodlust for people brought me to several conclusions. The most effective that I was either losing my mind in the mountains, or that I had come face to face with an American Indian folklore nightmare known as the Wendigo. Essentially what becomes of you if you cannibalize on human flesh. I've no plans on stopping on Route 1 overnight again. Talks with the locals included everything from ghosts to, of course, that same Wendigo I had encountered. I went on Route 1 again last week. The sounds of scraping metal were heard once more and I saw a shadow move across the forest at a blistering speed. I noticed that it didn't get too close this time, just close enough to see the fog from its breathe. It knows who I am. It's just waiting for me to let down my guard. Sixth Story Skinwalker Encounter in Yosemite This experience I am going to describe has taken a while for me to get together, and actually write down. I have experienced a few paranormal things, but this is the craziest one of all of them. It takes place in Yosemite National Park in August of 2017, with my two best friends Zach and Andrew. Zach had worked that summer as a parking agent at Glacier Point and was pretty familiar with the area. His employee housing he was given was a house in Wawona with two other guys. Andrew and I were visiting for the week and had each been to Yosemite before. One of the nights there we decided to watch the sunset over Chilnwalna Falls. It was a great hike that Zach had done before. The trail was about four miles to the top with about a 2,000 foot elevation gain. We brought food and decided to hike up and take a swim and eat at the pools on top of the falls. We set out a couple hours before sunset. As we approached the top portion, we were about a half mile to the top of the falls where a guy, about our age, early 20s, ran up to us from bushes frantically asking for help. His friend had fallen 50 feet off a cliff and had a shattered femur. Zach was used to this. After working in the park all summer he had seen many injuries and was used to it. The man didn't have cell reception but I did. So I called 911 and reported the accident requesting search and rescue. After a few minutes, we decided we wanted to continue the hike after search and rescue assured us they would be there soon with a helicopter. We told the guy help was on its way, and we continued the next half mile up to the top of the falls. When we got up there, it was a picture-perfect scene. A beautiful sunset as we swam and ate. We then got an amazing show as we saw the helicopter land to pick up the injured guy we just encountered. Right below us. I'm a private pilot and Air Force aviator so I loved every second of watching the helicopter land on the mountainside. After the sunset we began the hike down and past the spot with the injured guy and search and rescue was taking care of him. We had a brief encounter with them. They thanked us for calling it in. It was now dark out and we continued the hike down. There wasn't much moonlight, it was pretty dark so we used our phones as flashlights to see the trail. This is where the story gets interesting. The top of the hike was switchbacks with a steep incline on the right, 
and a steep decline on the left with shrubs and trees. It was definitely too steep to hike down, hence the switchbacks. About one mile into the hike down, Zach was in front with a light. I was second also shining my light, and Andrew was in back. Zach was shining his light ahead, and saw something sticking out from behind a tree that was about 15 feet ahead, just off to the right of the path, and instinctively shined the light at it. That's when whatever it was exposed itself from the tree, and ran across the path, down to the left and down the steep grade. It ran on two feet, and resembled some sort of humanoid. It was a little shorter than us and very clearly had two arms and two legs, but it moved in an inhuman way. It kinda resembled a person. It had a head and its limbs but appeared to be just skin. No clothes on at all. We all three saw it and stopped dead in our tracks. We continued shining the light to where it ran, down the left side of the mountain, but didn't see anything after it ran down. We were absolutely terrified, none of us really knowing what to say because we had no idea what we saw. The worst part was that we had another three-mile hike down, and mile and a half from the trailhead to Zach's house, all while knowing that this creature could be stalking us and was near. Luckily, we made it to his house terrified and exhausted, but without harm. Whatever it was must have been just as scared of us as we were at it. My question is if anyone else has had a similar experience in that area? I've done some research and my best guess would be a skinwalker, but it didn't try to lure us into the forest with it. We had a subsequent experience a couple years later, in Tioga Pass right outside of the Tioga Gate of the Park. We were camping in a closed campground in Tioga. On the middle of the night I woke up to piss, and before exiting the tent I saw an orb about five feet from the tent, floating across were a bright light. I don't think it was a person because Zach Andrew and I all saw the orb floating across, and there wasn't anyone around us. Our friend Jackson was also in the tent, and in the morning told us he felt rocks getting thrown at the tent all night along with hearing footsteps near all night. Does anyone have similar experiences? I'd love to hear them. We all know what we saw, and we know that it was not human. Seventh story. I saw something on my way home from work that scared me half to death. I've posted in here before, and ick if this story is allowed because it's not a ghostly experience or haunted house, but I have zero explanation for the event. Before I tell you my story, I'm going to give you some context about my drive home from work, the state I live in and such. This happened about 10 minutes after I left work today, July 4th, 2020. I live in Northeast Ohio, and I got a new job about two months ago as a process technician at a dairy plant. I pays very good money, considering it's a 34, 35 mile drive one way. After about 20 or 25 miles, I drive through a wooded area. Nothing uncommon for me, as where I live in any Ohio, forests are common, and I pretty much lived in the one behind my grandma's house growing up. I work 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., and the drive home sucks. Whether it's being tired, hungry, or the fog almost every night, I go the same way every day and night. I was driving my way home, I just left the residential area of my workplace and was going through the forested area. As I said, there's almost fog every night. So I'm on high alert for deer, raccoons and such critters. It's just like every other drive home so far. I have a podcast on, focusing on the road, thinking of getting either a sausage McMuffin or McGriddle from McDonald's and sometimes looking off to the side of the road for any eyes reflecting off my headlights. All of a sudden, I see some relfecting eyes. Out of the woods comes a coyote. In my hometown, coyotes aren't too rare. I've seen them by my high school, but had never seen one outside of my hometown, so it surprised me. I start slowing down as it crosses the road, until it turns to my car and sits in the road. It sat about 10 feet from my car. There had been no cars I had seen since leaving the residential area, so I was going to go around it, 
but I thought this was too odd of a thing to happen to just drive away from it. I expected it to just get up and walk away at any given second. This is where I began to get very scared. I honked my horn, and after about two or three seconds, it smiles at me. I have my brights on, so I can see it perfectly. This coyote had human-shaped teeth. My heart dropped and every hair on my body raised, just as it is now recalling this incident. It lasted about one second, before sitting up and running into the woods. I sat there in fear for about five seconds, before shoving my foot on the pedal and driving at getaway speed. I didn't stop and get food cause I had, and still have, no appetite. I thought the rest of the ride home what I saw, once doubting I saw it, but like I said, with my brights on and it as close to my car as it was, I saw it as clear as day. This coyote had human teeth, and there was no doubt about it. I'm very into the paranormal, and that includes cryptids. Is it possible I ran into a skinwalker or some genetically mutated coyote? I am Native American if that counts for anything. It's so weird typing this out, but I'd like someone who knew more about these things to help out if they can. I know one thing though, and that's I'm finding a new way to work. Eighth story. I survived a Wendigo. This isn't the first story. The first one will be posted after this. My apologies. I've been hidden for a while now. You know that feeling of your home being the safest place on earth, as if it was an impenetrable fortress? It's a foreign feeling. Well, as it turns out, it only resides when you feel as if there is a trust between you and nature. And when you have broken that wall with an entity, you've lost the feeling. The happiest feeling of them all, safety. My home was a sanctuary at one point. You could confide in it for days, if you wished. The feeling of comfort would draw people in like a compass towards the north. But it's gone now. It's foreign, as I said. You take it for granted, and when it's gone it's utterly crippling. You have to hide, you have to run, just to try to find solace in a place that has none. It's in my house. The feeling is gone, and it's in my house. I've been hiding in my cleaning closet for around two hours, pretty sure, and I don't know how long else this will last as the thing. The Wendigo is out for my blood, in my own house. I'll elaborate but I don't have much time. Last week it started with the taunting. The hello S and the Jack S still bumbling around in my mind as I type. The beast taunted me. Its bravado-packed lungs wanted to tease me, and get me to move from sanctuary to catch a kill, and that doesn't make me scared. It just pisses me off. It started with the taunting while I was camping, and when I got fed up, I yelled back at it, and many reverb voices came and yelled right back at me, including my dead elderly neighbor, its early prey. Then it followed me. I screamed at it, I shot at it, and I ran home, as it was the safest place for me and I wasted all the ammo on the damn kill. I sat there, for whatever feels like forever ago now, in front of my door, blocking it. But the creature is smart, found a way onto my leveraged patio, and glazed in my window. Then came the tapping, the slow consistent tink-tink-tink on the glass. It was soft, and the monster crouched down to not peer in the window, but the tapping, it was worse. It grew, slowly rising from the soft, tink 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 to thuds against the glass, slowly cracking the canvas from the middle out, until I heard it. Hello. The glass crumbled. It crawled in within the next second, the shards distinctly crunching under the weight of the thing. By this point I had my back turned, behind a door, so I had no visuals. The only thing guiding me to that thing was the, the soft smushing of the carpet under its feet, leading directly to the closet I was in. I leaned against the thin door as if it were a shield against a cascade of arrows, clinging my last hope tightly. It made it to the door. I heard it take a deep long breath in, then out. It leaned in close and sniffed. 
Repeat a couple more times, and he was on his way. He went over to my room door, which was across the hall. I heard the inhale, a stuttering one this time, since he was sniffing. He took a pause. It felt like he debated for a moment. I opened the closet door a tiny crack to instigate what he had stopped for. He had his head tilted, then took a step back and rammed the door with his antlers. I jumped at the noise alone, as he hit the door fairly hard. I looked back to see him rearing himself up to go at it again, and I focused on his antlers. They still looked splintered, as if he took on a tornado and landed headfirst onto his antlers from 100 feet up in the air. It looked as if when he took another ramming to the door, the antlers would crumble on impact. And so when he bowed his head and took a lunge forward and broke through the door, I was surprised. The door had a hole in it now. He had wriggled out of it a second earlier. The door had a hole, and to accompany it, the door bent inwards towards the hall, near the left upper corner, so much that the pole bit holding the hinge parts together and broke it to the extent that there was an inch of room between the two halves. He wrung three of his fingers into the gap of the door hinge and another four into the hole. He bent forward and pulled swift and fast, tearing the door from its hinges and breaking the overlapping frame with it. Preceding this, the beast stuck his head in, towards an angle so his antlers didn't get caught in the hole where the door used to be. I was scared he found a scent trail of my stuff, since he could then find me based off my scent. He went inside the room, and around 30 seconds of him sniffing around, he started rummaging. I thought I heard a low, raspy, S-C-U here. Yo, you are here. As if he was talking to himself, muttering. I slowly shut the crack of the door I was behind, and as soon as I had fully done so, I heard it. There were two thuds then a smash and crumble of the glass. I looked out of the reimbursed crack I made. He escaped. He smashed my window and escaped. Not only was I scared, now I was scared and pissed off, because now I have this damn thing taunting me like I'm its prey, in which I will not be. I'm going to leave this segment off here. I need to pack. I need to prepare for the inevitable. And I'm going to kill that damned beast. Ninth story. Have you tasted human flesh? I was 14 years old when I first met the Wendigo. The Algonquin-based Native American tribes believed Wendigos were, indeed, people. It is commonly known that the Wendigo is a human that has consumed human flesh. However, it is not commonly known that the act of cannibalism was considered to make a person vulnerable to an evil spirit, allowing them to be possessed and become a Wendigo. A mental illness is even named after it. Wendigo Piscosis is the need to consume human flesh as food. While some consider it to be made up, there is evidence to suggest its existence. A man called Swift Runner, in the 1800s, killed and devoured his family, despite the fact that he was 25 miles from food. More recently, in 1981, Issei Sagawa killed and consumed a woman, driven by desire? Curiosity? Maybe something more? The Wendigo legend is considered nothing more than a spook story. After all, the Wendigo is now only a scary monster, as detached from us as vampires or werewolves. After all, there is no one that is truly starving in the beautiful, gluttonous United States. Why would we fear consuming each other? We wet our appetites on gleaming, luscious meals day after day. In the dead of winter, surrounded by ice and snow and the howling of the wolves, we have our heating systems to keep us warm. But the Wendigo came to me that day. But not how I would expect. No, he did not lumber out of the woods, 20 feet tall and ghastly thin, supporting heavy antlers and a mouthful of ravenous teeth. He appeared to me, in the mirror, as myself. Because, at the heart of it, all monsters come from people, one way or the other. I stood in front of the mirror. 
I was plump with full cheeks then, almost pretty. He spoke to me with my own mouth, with my own voice. But my eyes were not my own. There was darkness. Gears of shadow clicked and rolled behind my irises. Have you ever tasted something worth the price? I was startled, of course. Who wouldn't be? I did not know what he was. Only research and agonizing would bring me to his name. What? I asked. I feared insanity. Maybe. What I had just said seemed to come from outside of me. Have you ever chased down your prey? He told me. Sunk your teeth into the body? Consumed their flesh? Every molecule? I was scared, of course. But what the Wendigo offered was almost intriguing. Perhaps they only come to those they know will be receptive to their call. No, I haven't. I told the mirror and watched the spirit go back behind my eyes. You grow fat on food not worth the boxes that contains it. But flesh, when you eat it alive, it is not only flesh. It is power, sweet and thick. The best meal you will ever eat. He left me then. I cried. Yes, you may mock me, but I cried. I was a weak little girl then, but the Wendigo was not wrong. What he offered me, what he offered my soft little body, was power, and power was a banquet compared to everything I had ever eaten. After months of thought, I decided to accept him. There were growing pains. I will not dispute that. I laid in bed. The Wendigo raged inside of me, growling, roaring, screaming. Pain racked my body for days on end, like a storm of ice raging inside of me. He was forgiving but not kind. He consumed my own flesh in place of what I did not eat. Chunks of it came off, leaving only clean bone behind. Two weeks later, I awoke hungry. It was dark. I checked the clock. It was around 3.30 a.m. It was much too early for my parents to be awake, so I snuck out of bed. Once, I might have feared shadows. Scary men in hockey masks peering around corners. But the Wendigo inside me assured that I would be the biggest threat in any room. There are benefits as well as costs to becoming a monster. I went into the kitchen, and I consumed. I ate everything I could reach. My teeth, which seemed sharper than usual, tore into packages and bags. I ate chips and cookies and candy. Wrappers and packages fell to the floor. I ate half a container of ice cream. I ate handfuls of potato salad. I tore open a container of raw beef for burgers and gorged myself on it. After I was done, I carefully cleaned up the mess and went back to my room. My stomach stuck out. Grotesque. Unnatural. I looked several months pregnant. I stared at myself in the darkness. My eyes were colorless in the low light. My hair hung like curtains around my face. Was it an illusion? Or was I taller? Was it an illusion? Or were my cheekbones sharper? Teeth larger? Why would you eat that garbage? The Wendigo howled at me in my own voice. I was hungry, I responded. Power, the Wendigo snarled. Power, power is what you want. I was hungry, I told him. I was wrong, of course. Only power would truly satisfy me, us. Only one meal would be worth it. I looked towards my door. I saw myself in profile in the mirror. My eyes were bulging out of my head. My mouth was hanging slightly open teeth still coated a bit with the blood from the raw beef. Outside of that door, my parents slept, unaware. They will be worth it, the Wendigo told me. I was hungry, I repeated. I love my parents. I went to sleep. Over the next few weeks, the Wendigo ate up my body. This was my punishment. He ate me like candy, giant chunks of me just falling off my body. He roared in my organs. He froze me from the inside out, a monster from the depths of the purest night, the deepest cold. It was almost beautiful. I looked in the mirror a few times. I couldn't recognize myself. 
The monster inside was making me different. I was taller. I was thinner, yes. My ribs stood out. The knobs of my spine were visible. My wrist bone was behind only a small layer of skin. I could bite through it, and my teeth would reach the bone. I would not devour my parents. I would not consume power, not yet. The Wendigo was inside of me, but he needed me to eat the flesh to truly take over. He wondered, he wondered. I wondered how the power would taste. I wonder, Nasleep, if you know where I am writing you from. My parents were very upset. They did not understand me and the Wendigo. They did not understand what I was becoming, what I would become. They told me anorexia was consuming me. Anorexia. So insulting. They were wrong. It was all him, and he was incredible. When they took me away, I bit the hand of a man wearing white clothes. His blood tasted electrifying on my teeth. I had not eaten garbage food for weeks. I had not eaten for weeks. The blood awoke my hunger. I write you this letter from the institution they sent me to. Someday, they will let me out. Tenth story. My boyfriend went missing in Glacier National Park. I know what happened to him. I stared, frozen in shock for a moment, as Stan darted off into the woods. He didn't wait for me to respond after yelling to run before he took off into the thick trees. I wondered if he had gotten a better look at whatever that thing in front of was. If that was what had caused him to dash off so quickly. I didn't have much time to think about it as my senses came back to me and I raced after him. Any concern over what we should be doing had flown from my mind along with any fears of falling. All I was focused on was catching up with Stan and figuring out what the hell had just happened. My tender ankle, combined with a shorter stride, meant that I couldn't run nearly as fast as Stan, though. Within a few moments, I found myself alone in the dark trees. I forced myself to continue onward, realizing I was screaming Stan's name at some point. It hit me all at once how incredibly stupid this was. We just run from the trail, the one source of some protection and safety we had. We didn't have a map, we didn't have actual flashlights, we didn't even have jackets. And now, of course, there wasn't even a we, I realized, slowing to a stop and gasping for breath. Stun. I shouted between gasps, my hands on my knees. The silence of the forest answered me. Had it always been this quiet? I wondered. I could have sworn the woods were alive with crickets and other nocturnal creatures earlier. Now, the darkness surrounding me felt almost alive, like it was some sentient force muffling any sound that tried to reach my ears. Taking another breath, I straightened up, shining my flashlight around for any sign of Stan. There wasn't any. He probably hadn't even realized I'd fallen behind. I was at a loss for what to do next. I realized I was no longer sure which direction we'd come from. The trees looked the same no matter where I looked. Fuck, I whispered. I looked around again, hoping for something that would help. I wasn't even sure what. And then I heard the scream. It sliced through the silence like a knife. I knew who it belonged to immediately. Stun. Stun. I shrieked, taking off in the direction it seemed like the scream had come from. A second scream sounded. It was filled with terror. I didn't think I'd ever heard Stan sound afraid like that. Stun. Where are you? I shouted. Stay back dash. His cry was cut off, instead turning into a strangled, choking sound. I had to be close. I swung my light around, trying to catch any sign of movement or color in the darkness. A flash of beige caught my attention. It didn't seem to match the surrounding trees. It had a scaly, almost shiny appearance. And then it was gone. I ran in the direction of it anyways, only to find a space between two trees where it had been. Everything after that was a blur. They say trauma does that, 
makes you forget details. Sometimes, whole events. I wasn't sure how long I stumbled around out there, still shouting for Stan. From time to time, I would hear something rustling in the bushes. Every time my blood would run cold, I'd change direction, trying to silently move away from the noise and hoping against all hope that whatever was out there didn't find me. It started to rain at some point. It plastered my hair to my face and soaked the thin, long-sleeved t-shirt I was wearing. After what felt like both hours and mere minutes, I saw a light appear in the trees in front of me. Then the voices reached my ears. Faint, at first, and then loud enough to make out the words. Well, I hope you're feeling better. I'm fine. I think I just ate something that didn't agree with me. A few moments later, I stumbled out of the trees, practically into the gravel parking lot. There were two people standing in the parking lot, in the headlights of a truck with a park service logo. I shielded my eyes. I heard surprised, then relieved murmurs as they noticed me. After that, I remember someone catching me as I collapsed, repeating that there was something out there. I'm fairly sure I wasn't making much sense at that point. One of the rangers, the blonde one we'd met before, ironically enough, hurriedly gave me a blanket, ushering me into the warmth of the truck while the other radioed the situation in. Apparently, they'd gotten a report of an abandoned car in the parking lot and had come out to investigate, I'd learn later. I'd gotten lucky and stumbled out of the tree lean just before they left. Sitting in the warm truck, feeling began to return to both my body and mind. Stan is still out there, I said, my voice weak from a mixture of exhaustion and fear. You have to go find him. This Stan was hiking with you? The other ranger asked. I nodded. We got separated. I heard him screaming. I think there's something out there. It got him. I collapsed into sobs at that point. All right, it's going to be all right. You're safe now, the darker-haired ranger said. I'm Ranger Tom Thornton. This is Ranger Alex Lindorm. What was your name? Michelle, I said, trying to take a steadying breath. Michelle Harrington? And you were hiking with someone named Stan? Tom asked. My boyfriend, I said. Uh, Stanley Daniels. We headed out late and it got dark so fast and I should have told him we needed to go back and then there was something out there. Alex gave me a sympathetic smile, nodding as if to encourage me to keep going. We heard it first, and then it this thing landed in front of the trail. I don't it was too dark to see what it was, and Stan started running, and I tried to follow him, but he was just gone, until I heard him screaming. Oh God the screams. They were awful. You guys have to go find him. You have to find whatever that thing was. It was following me. Oh my god. I collapsed into sobs. The rangers exchanged glances, and I realized how insane I must sound. Rambling about a vague something in the forest that had stalked me and attacked my boyfriend. To their credit, neither of them outwardly expressed their doubt of my story. When I finished speaking, Tom nodded. Okay, we're going to get a search party together for your boyfriend. How about you come back to the station with us? EMTs can check you out, and we can figure out what we're going to do next, Tom said. I gave a small nod through the tears that were still flowing. I just wanted to be away from that forest as soon as I could be. The drive back to the ranger station felt surreal, the trees spilling past the car window in a haze. I winced as my arm bumped into the truck's door while climbing out upon arriving. You okay? Alex asked. I nodded quickly. Did you hurt your arm out there? No, it's from something else, I said quietly. I shifted, pulling my sleeve further over the dark bruise on my upper arm. Okay, he said, for a moment looking like he wanted to question me further on that. I prayed he wouldn't. For the first time that day, it seemed like my prayers were answered. We headed inside, 
and by the time I was done answering a further barrage of questions and being checked out by the EMTs, the sun was beginning to peak over the horizon. The rangers had coordinated a search party in surprisingly little time. By the time the sun was fully up, they had already headed out there. A ranger named Crystal Everts was kind enough to keep me company for most of the sleepless morning that ensued. I found myself endlessly grateful for that company. I had never really thought about the after in these sort of situations before. It seemed like stories always ended with being rescued, the aftermath left to the footnotes. Now that I was experiencing it, I was glad it at least included a mug of coffee, even if it was instant coffee. Do you think they'll find him? I asked between sips. Crystal gave me a soft smile, but I saw doubt flickering in her eyes. They'll do everything they can. We have some of the best search and rescue rangers in the country, she said. I was silent for a moment. When I spoke again, it took me a moment to even realize I was doing so. It got him. What you thought you saw out there? Crystal asked. I didn't think I saw it. I mean, I don't even know what I saw. But I know there was something out there, I said. I sound crazy, don't I? I said after a minute. Crystal shook her head. You sound like you went through something very difficult. Sometimes, in those situations, our mind can play tricks on us, she said. That just seems like a polite way of saying I sound crazy, I said. I glanced past her to a photo on her desk. It contained a group of smiling people. I recognized three of them. The other three were unfamiliar. A tall man with a cowboy hat. A blonde woman wearing a bright orange tank top. And a redhead with a Medusa tattoo snaking around her upper arm. Those are the two rangers who found me. Are you friends? I attempted to change the subject, nodding to the figures I recognized in the photo. Thankfully, it seemed to work. Crystal glanced back at it. Alex and Tom? Yeah. They're good guys, she said. Who are the others? Truthfully, I didn't really care who the other people in the photo were, but talking about something random felt preferable to thinking about the present. Crystal seemed to pick up on that. Well... The blonde woman, that's Lauren, she's a tour guide. The bearded guy, he's a ranger too, his name's John. And the redhead, she worked here as a biologist dash, before she could finish. A man I didn't recognize appeared in the doorway. We found something, he said. Stan? I asked. He shook his head. A phone and a backpack. We think there's human blood on it. In the area you were found, we think it might be his, do you think you'd be able to confirm? Yeah, yeah, I can do that, I said. He glanced over at Crystal. There was something unreadable in his eyes. I couldn't even begin to decipher what it was. They took me to see the cell phone. It sat neatly in an evidence bag, a sight that seemed in stark contrast to the rusty brown that covered the now cracked screen. I felt my blood run cold. The bag was in much the same condition. I recognized it as Stan's immediately. It was the one he'd taken with us hiking that day. Now, one of the straps was torn, and the same red that covered the phone speckled the backpack. I felt my breath catch in my throat as I looked at it, somehow knowing that was all they would find of Stan. I told you it got him, I said my voice cracking in fear and barely above a whisper. Crystal looked at me sympathetically. Well, it does seem like something happened, she said. But for all we know, he could have just fallen and hurt himself. We might still find him. I glanced back at the bag, doubt filling my mind, and gave an unsteady nod. I didn't have enough energy left to try to convince anyone of a story that sounded crazy even to me. After I confirmed that the phone and backpack was indeed his, Alex and Crystal took me back over to my campsite. I had called my parents, I hadn't spoken to them in ages, so I can only imagine how it felt to receive a call like this out of the blue. Despite that, 
they were relieved, both to hear from me and to hear that I was okay. They'd insisted on flying out the next day to bring me back to our home. Home, that was a word that hadn't had a meaning to me for a while. Stan and I's apartment had never really felt like a home if I was being honest. They weren't the only ones feeling relieved, though guilt coursed through me as soon as I realized this. Stan was most likely dead, and I was feeling relieved? How fucked up of a person are you? God, he was right. I am a psycho. I thought bitterly as we drove back to the campground. The two rangers had volunteered, on their day off at that, to help me pack up the camp and drive me to a nearby hotel that my parents had booked. They insisted it was nothing, but as I stepped out of the truck and looked at the empty tent, that nothing felt like it meant the world. It didn't take long to pack things up, not with three people, and two with enough experience for at least a dozen. I wondered what I was supposed to do with Stan's things. Crystal left towards the end to use the restroom. Are you okay? Alex asked quietly as she walked away. Yeah, I mean I'll be fine. Stan is the one dash. No, I mean, are you okay? Alex glanced towards my shoulder, the one with the bruise. It wasn't what you think, I said, looking down and pulling my cardigan tighter around myself. I don't want to put you on the spot, but someone close to me was in a not-so-great relationship once, and they used to say the same thing. So, if it was what you think I think, I just wanted to say you're not alone. And things get better. I felt tears pricking my eyes, the little composure I had left breaking down. Thanks, I said quietly. Once Crystal returned, we finished loading my bag into the truck and headed to the hotel. It was a weird feeling leaving the park in such a different way than I had entered. When we got to the hotel, I checked in, and Crystal and Alex were nice enough to help me unload my things. Once I had brought the last bag in, I took a deep breath. There were countless things to do tomorrow. Talk to the police about Stan's disappearance. Figure out what I was supposed to do with Penelope. I figured I had always wanted a dog of my own. Meet my parents. Say thank you to the old man that had mentioned he'd seen two people headed up on the trail late. It had turned out the guy I'd thought was a creep had been the reason the rangers were at the parking lot when I finally found my way from the tree lane. Despite that, I guessed I would have trouble sleeping that night. My mind was alive with racing thoughts, pieces and snippets of the past 24 hours slowly forming into some sort of picture. It wasn't until Crystal and Alex were headed out that I was handed, literally, the piece of that picture that made it come together. Thank you both. I really appreciate it, I said, standing at the door of the hotel room. Of course. We're sorry about your boyfriend. We still haven't given up hope of finding him, Crystal said. I didn't correct her to say that I had. I wasn't sure how I felt so certain but I knew whatever was out there had made sure he wouldn't be coming back. We'll do everything we can, Alex said. He paused. Oh, I almost forgot. I picked this up at the campsite earlier, thought it might be yours. He pulled a map from his jacket pocket, handing it to me. I froze upon seeing it. It wasn't just any map. It was the map. The one Stan had sworn he'd put in his backpack the one I'd seen him put in his backpack, the one we'd been unable to find that evening. You found this at the campsite? I asked, slowly taking the map from him. He nodded. Where exactly? He gave me a quizzical look, as if he wasn't sure why it mattered. In the tent, by Stan's stuff. I had packed up Stan's stuff, and not only was I sure the map was in his backpack when we left for the hike, I was sure I would have seen it with his stuff. That wasn't possible, but what it implied seemed even less possible. I hesitated. I thought back to Stan and I's first in-person date. It had been during the height of the pandemic, so it was hard to meet up at first. When we finally did, we went to the zoo. He was so charming, so kind that day, 
I wished he had stayed that way. I thought of the countless arguments. The way I watched myself turn into someone I didn't recognize. The way he had hurt me. The nights I had spent crying. I took a deep breath. You know, I think you were right. What you said about trauma making people see things, I said to Crystal. I'm not sure what happened after Stan and I were separated. I'm not sure I actually even heard him yelling. I looked over at Alex. I hope your friend is doing better, by the way. She is now. And I think you will be, eventually, too. I gave a small nod. Maybe. Well, thank you again. For everything, I said after a moment. Have a good night, he said. I closed the door, feeling like I was also opening one to another chance at life, to healing, to freedom. I wouldn't have thought it started with an empty hotel room, but I guess life always has a way of twisting around itself, like a winding serpent. It's been years since Stan went missing now. As I guessed, he was never found, and eventually the search died down relegating his disappearance to an occasional footnote in stories about tragic things that happened in the park. There's some speculation it might have been a bear attack. Nothing else was ever found to confirm one way or another, though. Penelope is sitting on my lap as I write this. We both have an apartment in my home city now. I haven't been back to the park. Not out of fear, though. It just feels like a chapter that's closed, you know? Maybe snakes aren't so bad. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section. And like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.